Okay, guys, uh, welcome. I'm going to have to talk with my microphone shoved in my face for a little while. Uh, but welcome to the uh, video game law lecture by John Festinger. He's over in Vancouver, British Columbia right now, which is pretty damn exciting, joining us at the University of Auckland with uh, Aspect of Gaming and UAV. Just a bit of introductions and a bit of, uh, bit of housekeeping and cleaning. Uh, just again, welcome to, uh, to John and to the University of British Columbia. I'm Theo, by the way, from Aspect of Gaming, and I'll be hosting the lecture, so hi. Um, before we start, I just want to thank the University of Auckland Video, Video Game Club for getting us this room, getting us the catering as well. We're going to have pizza and drinks at the end, so that's going to be quite fun. Um, they're an amazing club. Definitely check them out and, uh, and support them. Uh, also, we are Aspect of Gaming. Uh, we're all about bringing gamers together in a huge variety of ways, including esports, live viewings, online tournaments, LANs, other events like this lecture. Basically, anything we can help out with, we'll help put on or we'll do ourselves. We find an, a way to do it or an avenue to, to put it on. Um, please support us by joining our social medias and, um, yeah, by coming to events, if you can. Uh, okay, without further ado, we're going to introduce John here, John Festinger. I'm just going to quickly get the introduction to him. Just a little bit of background. John is the Queen's Council of the Centre for Digital Media and the Law Professor at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, Canada. So, I'm going to give it over to you, John. Thanks for the introduction, Theo, and thanks for uh, everything that uh, you've done to put this together. Um, I did sort of get a glimpse of the crowd um, somewhere on the online feed, but uh, at least for now, I'm going to work off of uh, my slides, and uh, so I don't really see you, but I'm very interested in your questions and thoughts. Um, and I guess the uh, I've done versions of this before, but never quite in this way. I uh, in 2005 I uh, taught uh, a law course on video game law between uh, two different um, law schools that were about 30 miles away, and we joined them up uh, by video conference, and that actually worked very well. Uh, but uh, uh, thousands of miles away uh, is clearly a much bigger trick. Um, so, uh, one of the, uh, uh, and, and Theo, interrupt me any time, and if there are questions, uh, I, am, I, I am interruptible, uh, and it would be nice to make this as interactive as possible, if possible. Certainly will. Certainly will. Uh, I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions which I think are probably fair from uh, my knowledge of, of video game law and lore uh, around the world and I'm going to assume that Canada and New Zealand and certainly from what reading I've done um, share uh, a fair bit in common um, in terms of our legal perspectives um, uh, when it comes to entertainment generally, uh, when it comes to media generally. Uh, and that uh, there is a bit of a difference uh, that manifests itself in terms of games um, in that um, we are probably a little bit more offended by violence and 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 guns as a general uh, as a general cultural principle uh, than we are about uh, about uh, say sexual activity where in the United States uh, the opposite um, tends to be true uh, there sometimes seems to be more concern about uh, about condoms than there are uh, about guns. Um, and so I, I, I tend to believe that we have a bit of a shared common law, a commonwealth perspective and common law perspective uh, on some of these questions. And hopefully that'll come through um, in terms of uh, the talk in various ways. Um, if what you hear is of interest to you, and I don't know how many law students are uh, in the crowd and, and how many business students and others. Um, 
but there is a link to uh, my course at UBC Law School, uh, and uh, it is um, uh, it, it is not uh, a um, a fully open course, but all of the materials and all of the lectures um, are fully open and are all put online and the syllabus is open so anybody can access it uh, at, at any point. They teach the real students in the real classroom but all the materials are there and I keep it up year round um, and I tend uh, every week to put up materials that relate to the legal aspects of video games. Uh, so if you're interested please go there. Uh, I'll also just briefly mention that a couple of months ago, for those of you who are law students, you no doubt can uh, access this through the University of Auckland um, Law School Library in one way or another. Uh, the UBC Law Review had a special issue on digital media, video games, and the law, which I was a special editor of. Uh, and there's some, uh, I think, very interesting uh, and well done articles there. So. Um, little bit about myself. Uh, I uh, played a lot of Pong uh, in, uh, in law school uh, and in high school and then in law school. Um, and uh, I guess in, in law school in 1977, uh, the Intellivision uh, was uh, my gaming device of choice and myself and our gold medalist, uh, who was certainly not me, uh, but uh, a colleague of mine named Peter Hamilton, uh, and I played uh, a lot on the Intellivision, and his grades didn't suffer for it, uh, mostly in television, soccer, and, and baseball. Um, and then I was one of uh, seven people who bought a Sega Saturn, um, uh, which was a hugely failed gaming system. Um, my aha moment... Um, really came in the late 90s with a game called Grand Prix Legends, which uh, I won't uh, belabor here. Uh, suffice it to say that it was a PC game, uh, a racing game, uh, and, and I love cars, um, and racing cars in particular, and it was a hugely incomplete game. Uh, it was uh, released in a reasonably unfinished state, and what was remarkable about the game and uh, remarkable about my experience that in, in many ways led directly to my writing a book about video game law is that a community developed around the game and the community fixed the game, uh, built multiplayer that didn't work, redid the graphics from start to finish, um, turned the game into a huge success, uh, even though it had effectively been pulled from the shelves um, six months after it was released in 97. Uh, the, the game still lives on, but I would say it lived from 97 to 2007 and even beyond as a premier racing game. Um, the next picture is... Uh, is uh, my racing cockpit at home, just to show you that I'm serious about such things, uh, which in no way reflects uh, uh, anything other than a penchant for spending money um, and certainly doesn't reflect any talent whatsoever uh, in racing games. Um, and then the reality of, uh, of teaching and practicing law, which is that uh, mostly I'm playing bridge on my iPhone these days uh, and, and not indulging uh, quite as much as I'd like in gaming, although uh, I just bought a PlayStation 4 and I'm very excited about it. Um, any questions, Theo, before we move on? Currently no questions coming through. Well, then I will continue. Um, so why should you be interested um, in video games, what's important about games? Uh, this is just, you know, these are just toys. These are just, and, and uh, although increasingly not, um, you know, 15-year-old uh, male 
toys. The demographics of gaming has changed dramatically, largely uh, because of portable devices um, and uh, certainly all the women in, in my wife and my two daughters uh, play games, not just my son um, and I, uh, but really games, why are they important? Why should you care um, from a legal perspective? Why should you care from a business perspective? Um, and and here's where I think there's a very simple and very clear answer that for some reason that I can't fully explain um, gets overlooked. Uh, and, and we may see echoes as we go through of what that reason is. Uh, and I'll point it out, but I'll, I'll let you decide for yourself. But the reality is, um, if you're a business student, you'll, you'll recognize that video games were one of the earliest, if not the earliest, interactive digital technology that actually had a business model associated with it. And I mean truly interactive. I don't mean uh, a spreadsheet. I don't mean a, uh, a word processing um, uh, uh, program. I, I mean something that's interactive and that involved uh, more more than one person or potentially more than one person uh, or even just interacting with the game. Um, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that the reason games are important, particularly at this juncture of the digital age, uh, particularly when social media is all the rage, particularly uh, when Skype was purchased for uh, an ungodly amount of money uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, and we're seeing this uh, continuous uh, uh, growth is, um, and, and continuous monetization is because gaming did all of the essential things that digital media and social media are becoming known for today a long time ago. Um, and uh, that's important, obviously, from a business perspective. It's particularly important from a legal perspective, because if you look at video games, you can get a glimpse. Um, uh, if you looked at them closely, when I wrote my book uh, in 2005, um, you know, I could see in some ways, and I think reading the book would, would suggest this to you, certain things, and, and there was no brain surgery involved, about the future of digital media and social media just by looking at where games were in 2005. And I would suggest the same is absolutely true. Um, so let's just quickly catalog um, the, the, where, where video games uh, we're hugely ahead of the curve. Uh, interactivity, um, control, uh, devices, uh, um, you know, um, everything from uh, voice to, uh, to using a mouse to, uh oh, um, somehow my Chrome remote session has ended. I'm not sure what that means, Theo. I think you may have to send me another code. Just a minute. Just a minute. I will do that. Um, and and I will uh, continue until you do that. Um, oh, there it is. Let me sort of do this. Sorry, sorry, guys. Um, my wife keeps telling me I can't multitask, and uh, I think that's essentially true. Um, apparently research shows that women can multitask and we guys can't. So let's uh, see if this works. Um, in any event, uh, just going from memory, um, it's, it should be very clear if you think about it that, uh, that, that video games um, led um, uh, in, in terms of uh, control devices, uh, you know, uh, uh, flight simulators had joysticks. Um, in terms of online community, Grand Prix Legends was a great example. I won't go into the details, but the community was so strong. 
It really was social media before we think of social media. Uh, voice over IP, ple people were fragging each other using voice over IP long before Skype became uh, a popular technology. Um, uh, open world, avatars, 3D, uh, uh, virtual reality, all these things, portability, handhelds, um, all, well, and clearly handhelds, thanks to Nintendo and others, we were playing games on handhelds long before uh, we had our phones. Um, so it should be clear the leadership position the video games have had. And I would suggest um, that that hasn't changed. Um, and that if you want to look at the future of all media, um, look at gaming. Oculus Rift, which Facebook just bought for a, uh, a seemingly absurd amount of money, though you have to assume they know what they're doing. Um, why did they do that? That was a that's a gaming peripheral. It was built as a gaming peripheral. Um, clearly, it's not just going to be used as a gaming peripheral, or Facebook wouldn't have paid that much money for it. So, um, I, I don't think it's unfair or too long a bow to draw to suggest that video that if you want to see the future of digital media look at video games today if you want to look at the present of digital media look at video games five years ago and uh you can play this game indefinitely now hopefully i can get the slide to change um there we go, there we go. uh so what uh, is uh, a video game, what is a game, um, is uh, an important question and essentially the theme of this talk, as simple-minded as that question seems to be. Um, and, but it's important um, because we have to ask ourselves, where does the law come in? Where does the law become relevant to games? And here I'm going to take you to uh, a pre-video game concept, but not a pre-game concept or a pre-play concept, called uh, the Magic Circle, um, which was uh, um, um, found... Uh, suggested uh, by a theorist named Johann Huizinga. Um, and the basic notion is that there are fields of play where reality is changed. And it's the magic circle. It has its own rules. And those rules suspend the rules of the external world. And those, those, uh, those could be the playground, it could also be the court of justice, where uh, if you're in England, people wear wigs. If you're, I think, in New Zealand and Canada, we wear robes. Um, the temple, the stage, the tennis court, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the notion simply is that there's a magic place. And in that magic circle, the law should find no particular uh, should not should, should find no favor and should not disrupt. So it's a it's a very interesting concept, um, and the, the, one of the core questions is um, where does the magic circle stand today? And and we're going to end up talking about that a fair bit. Um, so. Is there a virtual world? You know, is World of Warcraft its own country? These are all um, suggestions that I've heard and seen relatively seriously in certain uh, formats, often from academics. Um, usually um, a long time ago, maybe a decade ago, versions of these questions. Um, things... Um, started getting uh, a little bit more heated 
um, you know, around 2000, between 2005 and 2010. And I, I, I'm not going to take you through, there's an entire, or at least half of an entire lecture on the Video Game Law course uh, website if, if you really are interested in this. But the, the core question of where, where do, when do we let the law in and when, we, when don't we um, has essentially been answered um, in uh, the most, I think, the most practical way by saying, well, the magic circle should be preserved, but the more that real world mechanisms are used in gameplay, so what do we mean by that? Uh, the more that commerce happens in game, uh, you know, the more that you uh, y you use microtransactions in your game, uh, the, the more that your game somehow uh, is not just on a screen but involves the real world, um, the more that happens, the more real world laws have a right to intercede. And uh, th that's uh, a version of, of where we are. Um, uh, so, uh, and if you reflect on it, it's not illogical that uh, if there's uh, a real cash economy in a game um, and real money is being used, it shouldn't be exempt from the laws that apply to real money. But if real money isn't being used, then there's an argument that real laws shouldn't apply. And, um, you know, there, there are some wonderful games out there uh, that really suspend reality, really suspend ethics, and don't necessarily uh, spill over into the real world um, uh, in, uh, or, or spill over uh, and intersect with real world laws. Uh, in the most direct way, um, and you know, it probably does make sense to let that go. Now, there there may be a whole lot of questions uh, on, on this point, so I'll um, I'll just pause for a minute and uh, listen to Theo as to whether there's anything, any questions anybody wants to ask. Brilliant. Now, there are a few questions, however, they're more broadly interpreted and, uh, and probably for a later stage. Just have a look at them. Uh, a user asked, has asked two questions joining us on Twitch. He says he'd like to learn more about copyright laws and about age restrictions in Australia and why they're such jerks about it, as he so plainly puts it. And another from the Twitch channel asks why games are still aimed for the male audience when it's been proven that there are increasing numbers of female gamers as well. So that does move into your um, into your breach of of uh, gender in law as well and video games. Okay, so um, uh, on uh, the first question. Um, I have no idea why the Australians are jerks. I would suspect that uh, people in New Zealand might have opinions on that. Um, no, sorry, that was a really feeble attempt at a joke. <laughs> uh, feeble attempt at a joke, knowing uh, from, from some of my Kiwi friends exactly where the rivalries fall. Um, uh, you know, I, 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 let, me, let me try and briefly deal with uh, the, the question of the age restrictions. Um, because I do think there is a Commonwealth theme here. Um, in British Columbia, uh, around uh, 2000, 2002, 2003, um, a, a, a dear friend of mine who's now the, the Chancellor of uh, Simon Fraser University was our Minister of Justice and tried to pass a law um, which I believe is quite similar to the laws Australia uh, stands. And, um, uh, you know, and not everybody accepts uh, the American rating system. And, you know, the real reason, and I sort of alluded to it earlier, is I think the cultural issue of violence is taken... Um, uh, 
uh, more seriously uh, in Commonwealth countries, and and there are factions of society that are more offended by extreme violence uh, than in the United States. Um, uh, and again, these are vast generalizations, and they're not necessarily fair, so I want to acknowledge that. Um, and, uh, you know, on the other hand, um, you know, the, I, I, you're going to have to send me uh, another... Um, uh, uh, an, another um, Chrome um, control thing, Theo, because uh, it it keeps on flashing yeah, out. Yep, um, yep, will do. Uh, and I don't know. Maybe I I need to just be moving the mouse. So I'll figure that out. In any event, um, uh, and and yet in in uh, in in the United States. There's a great deal of offense taken um, around uh, certain moral issues relating to sexuality um, uh, and and um, and so games have gotten skewed um, a little bit because the American market is so large, and games have probably gotten more violent and less relational if i if i can use that word and that may also explain to some extent why um uh women um are uh well if you if you think it through you might understand why women are kept a little bit more peripheral to games just for the fact that and and again, this is a generalization, so I want to be careful because I've certainly met some very hardcore first-person shooter fans who are women and love playing FPS games. I, and I don't particularly like FPS games. I, I play them, but I'm not absolutely crazy about them. Um, but generally speaking, if games are going to be more violent and less relational, then they're going to be more male. And the people who are going to make those games are going to tend to be more male. And so it becomes a bit of a, um, a, uh, 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 a self-reflecting, in, in this case, a negative cycle. So there you are. I've answered both questions in, uh, in, in one uh, long, twisted uh, circle. So hope Thanks that works. <laughs> So um, back to where we are. Uh, so now the, 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 where, I, where I've gotten to is um, what is a game and where does the law come in? And so we've, we've talked about that, but now I want to turn to IP which was, I guess, the, the second question, so I knew I was going to get there soon, um, and take you, get you to focus on when something becomes a game in intellectual property terms. Um, and on this, this is an American paper, but it's a very brilliant one. And um, it, it, I think, is extremely helpful. It's a, it's a paper called Games and Other Copy, Uncopyrightable Systems by Bruce Boyden. And in the United States and in Canada and in New Zealand and in Australia, um, it is generally accepted that games, not video games, but just games, are not copyrightable. So uh, the game itself... Uh, the game of basketball, the game of soccer. Um, uh, th there's actually a case on the game of roller derby. Um, are not <laughs> subject to intellectual property protection. And lost in the mists of time is why. Why would that be? And, and uh, an academic named Bruce Boyden did a particularly brilliant job of trying to figure this out. And uh, he came to the conclusion that there were two 
legal possibilities. One was, and, and, and I don't know how many lawyers are in the audience or otherwise, but um, uh, you'll just have to take my word for it if you're a non-lawyer, um, uh, that in the Western canon of law, ideas are not protectable, only the expression, the fixed expression, the written expression, the, uh, the expression of the idea is protectable. So not an idea, uh, but the expression of an idea. Uh, not a lunch conversation, but what's written on the napkin during the lunch conversation. Um, and so that's one possibility. And then there's another possibility is that systems and processes are not protectable in, in copyright law. So uh, a spreadsheet, the concept of a spreadsheet, um, uh, you, you know, you may have heard that uh, a recipe is not protectable. It's simply a list of ingredients. Uh, uh, you know, the phone book, um, the scores of sports games uh, are not protectable. Um, and Boyden comes to the conclusion that the real reason that games are not protectable is because they are systems. And the magic of a system is that it doesn't really mean it anything unless there's a person interacting with the system that gives it life. And if you think about it um, from, you know, and without getting too philosophical or too Zen, uh, you know, there is no game without the player. And there is no video game without the player. Uh, there is something, there's some art, there's a lot of code, um, there's all sorts of stuff, but there isn't a game, a video game per se. And so if, if you reflect on this and you put it side by side with Huizinga's magic circle, you start going, aha, uh -huh, or hopefully you start going, aha, uh -huh. there is something interactive, there's something communal, and in an intellectual property sense, that takes you pretty close to going to saying, well, who is the author of this game? Nobody plays Grand Prix Legends exactly the same way as I do. They play it a lot better, but no one, no one you know, makes that turn at Spa the same way or slides the same way or takes exactly the same line or approaches at the same slow speed that I do or breaks at the same point. So how much of the game is the programmers? How much of the game is mine? And you can ask that in a video game and it's particularly easy to ask in a non-video game context, uh, in, 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 in the context of, uh, of soccer or rugby or uh, uh, any, any, any uh, game that you care to play, bridge or otherwise. So. Uh, what I love in, in Boyden's uh, uh, paper is this, is, is this line, systems are shells into which users pour meaning. And um, that makes the question of intellectual property a very, very challenging one in terms of video games. Because if you accept that premise, which really does seem correct, you now have to start thinking in terms of the rights of gamers. And we'll talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, but before we do, I want to go uh, a little bit backwards um, and, uh, and, and just quickly talk about the IP threshold for games. When is a game copyrightable? And I'm going to take a short break after this for questions, Theo, just to give you a warning. Uh, this, is, this is fairly short. Um, I am thinking, hoping, assuming that everyone has seen the game of Breakout, um, uh, probably because uh, they've had it in one form or another 
uh, on a mobile device. And it's a very, very simple game. It's a paddle and a, uh, and, and a ball and bricks. Uh, in this case, they're depicted as different colors. You hit the ball, a brick disappears, and the notion is to destroy all the bricks. And the way to do it is basically to get behind the bricks and, and let the ball do all the work. Um, very, very simple game. When the producers of, uh, of, uh, uh, of Breakout, uh, in this case Atari, uh, tried to register Breakout for copyright protection, uh, the U.S. Register of Copyright turned them down. And they were turned down on the basis that the game, the video game was too simple. It, it simply used, um, you know, simple colors, uh, uh, simple, very simple shapes, very simple sound, um, and very simple physics. And what could possibly be copyrightable about that? Uh, and if you read the decisions, which I'm not suggesting anybody does, you'll see that there was a certain snobbery um, that was at play here. Uh, you know, of um, perhaps the register of, of copyright looking down his nose uh, at this new medium. Uh, and, uh, and, and the... Uh, the upshot of it was a, was a, a case, and uh, ultimately, uh, Atari won, and and uh, and Breakout was uh, given copyright protection. But the real key was a question that was asked in the lower court, and it was certainly mentioned in the court of appeal. Um, uh, and, 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 you know, it, it's interesting because this case had to go to the U.S. Court of Appeal twice. The Register of Copyright turned uh, Breakout down for copyright protection on two separate occasions. Um, he just wouldn't give it. Uh, but the lower court question was, if Picasso had painted a round object on a canvas, would you say because it depicts a familiar subject, namely something that is round that it, it would not be subject uh, to copyright protection. Sorry, Theo, we're going to have to do it again. Um, and the upshot of the question, which you have in front of you, uh, was that the register of copyright said, no, of course I would register Picasso's uh, round ball for copyright protection, which, you know, obviously, uh, in in the eyes of a court, translates into well, why wouldn't you register Ataris then? Uh, because there really is no reason. So, uh, the the bottom line is that there is a very low threshold for copyright protection. And if you are reflecting on the things I've said, you may see um, that this is good from the perspective of dealing with the anti-video game snobs out there, but it also sets up a real collision course. Um, copyright protection being a very low threshold, and in uh, the description of what of 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 what is copyrightable um, uh, that I went through before, um, the notion uh, that um, I, I'm just going to go back a couple of slides uh, to 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 show you exactly. Uh, what I'm talking about, uh, the notion that users have all these rights. So now, who's got the copyright? Is it the gamer or the producer of the game? And if the threshold is low, 
who's it low for? And does it mean it's high for somebody else? And where that leads is directly to the question of what do you do with mods? What do you do where the users are generating and creating content? So hopefully I've set up enough of a conflict here. Um, and on that note, I will just ask Theo if there are any questions or anything I should be dealing with. Um, not specific questions. There were speculations on the answers to your previous questions. However, nothing, uh, nothing related to questions specifically. No. Oh, we have a question from the live crowd. Yep. Um, so your question was, okay, so we, he's saying that games cannot exist without the gamer, therefore, by extension, it's their right to own that property when they purchase it? Well, sorry, Theo, am I on? Yep, 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 yep. Um... What I'm saying is that it's it's a conundrum as to who owns what at what point. Um, uh, clearly, copyright protection comes to the creator of the game. But, but now we start seeing um, why gamers might have some rights. And um, I don't fully know, it would be really great if there was an intellectual property professor somewhere in the audience, um, uh, but uh, because I don't know the precise state of the law in New Zealand, but in Canada last year, and really if you examine the cases closely over the last decade, um, it's, 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 you know, the, the Supreme Court of Canada doesn't just show up, they, they prepare you, as I'm sure uh, do the courts in New Zealand for big changes. But l about a year and a half ago, five copyright cases, five intellectual property cases were released on the same day. And they essentially had a common theme. And the common theme was users' rights. Users have rights. And Canadian copyright law has been amended. Um, I won't say because of those decisions, but I would say consistent with those decisions um, to allow for all sorts of copying privileges and users' rights um, uh, in a non-commercial setting. So, you know, this, quite, this slide that I have up here about freedom to mod or create, if you were doing it and it had no commercial impact on uh, the game that's being modded or the, the people who made that original game and you didn't sell your mods, um, there's a pretty darn good argument in Canada that you're good to go, that there's no issues. Um, but I don't know whether other Commonwealth courts have adopted the Canadian decisions. My suspicion is that they will and that the Canadians and that the Supreme Court of Canada uh, made some particularly brilliant decisions. Um, but these things take time and the right cases have to float to the top of the pile uh, and, and, and get decided upon. So I hope that at least partially answers the question. Yep, certainly. Yep, certainly. Um, so very quickly, sorry, I'm losing a little bit of control over my slides here. Um, uh, video games are this great example uh, of, uh, of, and becoming increasingly a clear example of not being able to dif differentiate um, nearly as much as what was once possible between the creator of the game and the person playing the game. And we increasingly have these massively open worlds where the game is to build stuff. 
and build your own stuff. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, SimCity was, was a version of that, but we've clearly, uh, and you'll recognize the, the picture, uh, have, have moved uh, well beyond. Um, and, uh, I, I just want, and I'm sorry to harp on Grand Prix Legends, but I just want to show you that, uh, you know, on the left side, you will see the, or the original art in Grand Prix Legends, and then you'll see on the right hand side, the community art for Grand Prix Legends. Um, and that should give you a sense, uh, and you tell me what's right and just between in the balance between creators <laughs> and, and users and users as creators. Um, there, there aren't uh, huge answers. There's a, there's a couple of cases. I'm not going to go into them in any great detail. Uh, there's, there's a, a case in the States called Blizzard versus Internet Gateway where Blizzard sued uh, the makers of, I wouldn't call it a mod, uh, it was, Blizzard came up with something called Battle.net, which had advertising in it, and when released didn't work that well. The community created a Battle.net clone that didn't have advertising, worked very well, um, uh, but, but I wouldn't call it a game or a level. It was, it was, a, it was a multiplayer platform. Uh, Blizzard sued and succeeded, uh, but the essence of their argument was that there wasn't any creativity to what was being done, which I don't think is really true, but that was their argument, that the modders weren't doing anything creative, they were just doing something very technical and pedestrian. And the reason they had to make that argument is that if, if it was creative, uh, then freedom of speech, freedom of expression, uh, and some of the notions I've talked about earlier, and certainly now the notion of, of users' rights, um, could, would, would come in and, and quite possibly have defeated Blizzard. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but I think Theo will make sure that the slides will be available, and, and indeed the slides will also be up on the Video Game Law site if, if you're interested in them. Um, now, I just want briefly um, to... Uh, to talk about the sort of Escher-esque, um, uh, Escher being the, uh, the artist who, um, who draws uh, things that defy reality, that go, you know, takes sort of three dimensions, puts it in two dimensions, and, and makes it impossible. Um, th this is, this is uh, kind of the video game law version uh, of the impossible, of the impossible. Uh, it's a case called Escobedo versus THQ. Uh, Escobedo is a tattoo artist. Uh, THQ at that time, it's now EA, but uh, previously made the UFC games. Um, and there was, um, uh, and, and THQ entered into a contract uh, with a UFC fighter. Well, they entered into contracts with all the UFC fighters. Uh, but a fighter by the name of Carlos Condit. And Carlos Condit had uh, Escobedo, uh, a, a tattoo that had been administered by Escobedo, um, had been drawn on his body by Escobedo. And um, Condit enters into a contract with THQ. THQ reproduces, um, uh, reproduces uh, Condit, uh, in lifelike form in the game, including Condit's tattoo, Escobedo sues THQ. There's no contract between Escobedo, the tattoo artist, and Condit, uh, the UFC fighter, who has Escobedo's uh, tattoo on him. And so you get into this kind of, you know, mirror within mirror within mirror image uh, around copyright law. Um, to me, uh, and there have been other similar cases, they've, they've been settled, and, and, uh, but to me, this comes down to, uh, it's your body. The, the tattoo artist clearly has a right to uh, apply this tattoo to others and to use his art for others, but once that tattoo is on my body, 
isn't it my body? And the tattoo artist should have no right over my body. Um, we'll have to see uh, how these cases go. So, uh, you know, intellectual property law and copyright law can be interpreted, I think often wrongly, far too literally. Um, and, and this could end up being one of those cases. So, um, the question that uh, you, at the end of the day, can't avoid wrestling with is, is when you're dealing with this balance between users' rights, the right to mod, and the developer's rights, the artist's rights, the person who made the game in the first place, is is creativity more than property, more important than property. If you make IP law and copyright simply property law, uh, then you, uh, you don't necessarily leave the room for the gamer, for the player, for the user. And this is the essential question, not of video game law, it is certainly an essential question of video game law, but the, the, go back to my original premise, that if you look at video games, you can see the future of all digital media. This is the essential question of social media and the digital age, where we are all creating, we are all creators. We're all taking, not all of us, but you know, many of us are taking selfies. If, you know, the sort of the famous example, um, who owns that selfie taken during the Academy Awards? Hey, John. Hey, John. Yeah. Um, just uh, a quick question that relates to exactly what you're talking about uh, in the comments section. Kenoka asks, how do most company feel, how do most companies feel about games that start off as mods of their games? but then branch out into their own creations, completely different from the source material. Well, first of all, let me, let me just uh, say what a great question that is. Um, uh, you know, and different companies have different views, but the prevailing view, uh, and if you look at, um, you know, the, 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 the contracts that come with games, um, increasingly, uh, games makers want their audience to make mods and be involved and create stuff for the game. And, um, and, and that's, uh, again, uh, it makes the game more viral, it makes the game more engaged, it, it engages community. Um, uh, it, you know, Minecraft, obviously, is the best example. Uh, where Notch really has opened up the game, and because he opened up the game, the game really has been created by the users, and it's a worldwide phenomenon for a game that, um, you know, I think it's attractive, but it's it's hardly cutting edge in terms of how it looks. Um, the game really is the users, but but increasingly, and not in all cases, uh, but increasingly we see. Um, uh, you know, game makers uh, opening up their games. I, the, the best example I can think of is Microsoft Flight Simulator, when it was around, would actually release all their source code and actually allow an industry to arise that charged for mods uh, as a way of spreading the word about Flight Simulator. And, you know, that was maybe a strategic move by Microsoft because when they started doing this, uh, you know, around 98, 99 and onwards, it may have even been a little before that, but when they started doing it in earnest, they were in all sorts of trouble with the U.S. antitrust authorities for keeping their systems closed. So this may have been a symbolic way of opening something that may have served a strategic purpose. But you know, then the other thing that happens, and I want to go to the second part of the question, the other thing that happens is that g as games get further away, as the mods get further away from the original game um, and have less to do with the original game, there's 
better arguments, uh, hardly foolproof arguments, but there are better arguments that it's a new, th this is a new work of art and it belongs to the gamer. It belongs to the creator of the mod, not the creator of the game. Um, and uh, so where, where this one sort of lives is, uh, and we haven't seen the gaming decision, but we've seen some of these decisions in art where uh, you might remember or have heard about um, a case that involved um, an image of Barack Obama that was um, uh, that was used um, by an artist whose name escapes me right now and modified. Uh, to create a work of art. Um, and I think ultimately there was a settlement, but the artist had a pretty good um, freedom of expression case in modifying uh, someone else's picture to create his Obama art. That was a mod in a sense. So hopefully that answers the question, but these are terribly important questions. And, you know, there's my question. Can I mod yet? And the true answer in law, I think worldwide is, no one really knows this is the issue of the age. Um, any further questions? I want to see how I'm doing uh, on time. Um, how roughly, how, uh, number one, questions, and number two, Theo, from your perspective, how much longer would you like me to go? and assume that I can wrap up at any point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, good time. So good time. Uh, oh, get, the uh, get the mute. Thank you. Um, so for time, we're sitting at 5.23 p.m. in New Zealand. Uh, we'd like to start questions at 5.30, but we can go a little bit longer, so we're a bit strapped for time. Uh, for questions, it's uh, we do have one coming up from the audience there. Uh, actually, two coming up. Well, let's go with the questions and yep, yep. we're just asking them now. Sorry, it's it's hard to get the microphone over to them. Um, she wants to talk to you a little bit more about the Picasso point that you made about the spherical object and um, and uh, copywriting that in terms of copyright. Uh, she wants to ask also about the, specifically uh, from that point, about the Candy Crush saga, how they managed to copyright Candy Crush. And I, I just thought of another example. Uh, Cadbury managed to copyright a specific color of purple as well. So a lot of general objects seem to be easily copyrighted in this generation without too much fuss. Okay, so... Can I, uh, can I go? They, yeah, they copyrighted, yeah, they copyrighted, the, copyrighted word the, word the word candy. Um, so, to, to bring some clarity to this, um, there is a big difference between copyright and trademark. And uh, what... The Candy Crush question is about is whether the word candy can be trademarked. And I think um, they've backed off on that. Um, uh, I, I'm not an expert on, uh, on fashion, but I, I know that uh, I think it's uh, Christian Louboutin. Um, my, my daughter loves fashion stuff. Um, got a trademark on the red at the bottom of their shoes. So trademark shouldn't be confused with copyright. Um, the, the, uh, the, the, um, the case that I talked about earlier, the Atari versus Oman case, was a pure threshold of copyright case. It, 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 it had nothing to do with the objects being trademarked. Trademark is a purely commercial concept. I don't know that, uh, you know, um, I certainly have another lecture that can deal with the differences, but I don't know that we have the full time today to get into it. Uh, does that make sense to everybody? I hope. A, a little bit. A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> um, 
But uh, I guess I just, I, I think just to summarize, trademarking very different from copywriting, and trademarking is more flexible. No, um, let, let, let me let me let me try and do it this way. There's basically basically three kinds of intellectual property law: uh, copyright, trademark, and patents. Um, copyright has to do with I'll call it ideas that become words, um, and uh, or art words that become art. Trademark has to do with commercial recognizability and nothing else. So you trademark things like Coca-Cola. You trademark things for pure commercial recognition. You couldn't trademark the entire code for a game. You couldn't trademark a game. You could trademark a brand. Trademarks simply deal with brands. Um, and, and lastly, patents deal with technological innovation. Hopefully that makes it clear now. Okay, cool, thanks. Um, and another um, question, and another question. just coming up, just a second. Okay, uh, this person, he asks if, um, oh sorry, he doesn't ask, if he asks your opinions on the fact that the, the Minecraft point you made, Mojang has released uh, a statement or, or it's just about modding in Minecraft. Mojang has said that when you create a mod in Minecraft, you have to release that source code to everybody. So in, in a sense, it's not your own, it's, it's everybody's, but it's, it's built on that platform. So he's forcing everybody to release their source code to everybody. So nobody owns it. Technically, everybody owns it. Um, well, I, I completely endorse that. Um, you know, that's how, you know, my video game law website is. I, I you know, I, I, I've got a license on there called the Creative Commons license. And it basically says anybody can use it for any purpose they want, as long as they let everybody else use it as well. And they, you know, so... You, you know, you you can't simply take my property. I think what 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 Notch is saying is, um, I want you to mod, but you can't take my property and then close it and sell it on, on better ter you know, on more advantageous terms to yourself than to me. This is my creativity. So if you want to play with it, you've got to play with it by keeping it as open as I've made it. And I've got no philosophical quarrel with that. It makes perfect sense to me. Now, I will point out that in the Microsoft example, um, they went further. Microsoft said, hey, you can go out there and you can, in effect, use our code and close it up and, and sell it and create your own company, your own business. And there were some very significant companies like uh, and some in Australia I don't know of any in New Zealand but I think one in Australia called Abacus uh, that, that I think uh, did very well um, but so I, 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 I'm very much in favor of what Notch did but I can see the other side of the argument if someone wanted to raise it it's, it's not very capitalistic yeah definitely I mean he, he points the, out the fact that Minecraft is more of a platform and people do create a lot of their own code, a lot of their own skins and put a lot of their own legitimate work into the projects that they create for mods um, and that's why they feel that they should have the right to make it their own if they want it to be because it's, it's sort of like 50% Minecraft and 50% actual their own creation. Well, and, and you know, th this is probably the perfect... Um, segue into the next section which i'm going to do very very quickly um but but it, it, it's actually the perfect question for it so if it's okay i'm just gonna quickly move on and wrap up is that okay definitely definitely okay 
So uh, the reason it, it's the perfect segue is because I'm going to suggest to you that what's really happened is that we live in a world where IP and copyright law um, and, and even trademark law to some extent, but certainly copyright law, are, have become and are becoming profoundly unimportant. Um, and that may sound really crazy to you, except think about every time you game, every time you open a new game, you sign a, you you agree to an end user license agreement, to terms of service, um, privacy uh, terms, et cetera, et cetera. We are actually in the po we are, if not in the post IP world, very, very close to it. And again, video gaming is leading the way, not necessarily for the better. So the terms on which you're living your gaming life is ruled by contract. And if the contracts modify uh, the, the copyright laws of the land, which they do, the courts have generally held that the contract will rule. And that's particularly troubling when nobody actually reads these documents in the first place, which is rapidly becoming a huge legal problem. So whether you agree with Notch as I do, or you disagree with Notch as someone in the audience does, the reality is that when you go into Minecraft, you've agreed to Notch's terms and conditions. So all the blather about whether copyright law lets you do this or lets you do that doesn't matter because Notch in a contract with you that you've agreed to said you can't do it. And that's the world we've come to uh, and are rapidly coming to. And again, leading the way is video gaming and not necessarily for the better. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm going to just, uh, you know, point out, uh, uh, especially for the libertarians uh, uh, among you, um, you know, sort of the Apple system, uh, they will they will say, gee, we don't want a political game. Um, so you're not going to get into the App Store if you have a game we don't like. And this is a matter of contract. This is not a matter of anything else. It's a private space. And so again, we're really getting into... Um, rather huge issues and gaming is leading the way. Um, I think that uh, time is not going to permit me to talk about uh, uh, two things, one of which I knew I wouldn't have time to talk about, and that is violence and sexism in games. Um, but the future of video games and where all of this is going to go um, and what it's really going to be about is privacy. And I will uh, just, I'll, I'll just hold on this slide to simply say that, um, that Oculus Rift, the purchase of Oculus Rift by Facebook, um, and some of the other trends in gaming are, are all moving towards an even more immersive world um, on one hand, and a world that uh, that allows you, if you think of Google Glass, um, to play and have your alternate reality in a real world context. So this blending of the real world and the game world um, that is increasingly happening. Um, and th that's really profound because there's no such thing as a one-way pipe. And so the, the more deeply we become immersed um, the, and, and the, the more uh, deeply we let games um, uh, know us and know us intimately, the more it is possible, and I'm not talking about next week or next month, but it, the more it is possible in 10 years, for example, in a post-Edward Snowden world, that we can be manipulated through our games and we can be spied on through our games. 
And if you really think about it, if, if to those of you who are gamers, serious gamers, uh, serious FPSers um, who play multiplayer, um, you know, you know very well the people you're playing with and that their, uh, the way they play, the way they game, uh, the way they make decisions while they game, um, you, you know a lot about them. So if all that information is up there in a big data world and somebody knows exactly how you make decisions on a very profound level based on, you know, hundreds, thousands of hours of gaming decisions that you've made and is able to extrapolate out there that, that information out there, they potentially, along with all the other information that's out there about you, know an awful lot, of, uh, know an awful lot about what you're going to do, arguably even before you do it. And um, I, I don't want to ring alarm bells. Um, I, I just think this is a really interesting and important issue. And, you know, for me, it's the issue that I'm currently um, spending uh, a fair bit of my time in terms of kind of the, the next bit of legal research that, you know, the next papers that I want to work on. This is very, very high on my list. I know there's an awful lot of people who like, you know, really, really interested in robotics and drones and all of that from a legal and even a gaming perspective. That doesn't interest me nearly as much as um, how games can get into our head and take away our freedom of thought. So um, I don't know, Theo, that I, that I absolutely need uh, control over my slides anymore. Um, I hope I've stayed more or less to your time frame. Um, no, it's been great. No, and, and we can we can go to questions from here. Cool. Um, cool. I'm going to steal the stage for this for this next question and be a bit naughty and skip not not skip the other ones that are coming through, but uh, ask my own one. For the future of video games, you you're talking a lot more about going into virtual reality and that kind of thing, and that begs the question of if people are working within or sorry playing or experiencing life within virtual environments and they agree to terms and conditions, isn't there or shouldn't there be a limit to what conditions these people, these people who are creating the games impose on us? Un you've got to unmute yourself there. Sorry, um, thank you. <laughs> I was doing pretty well up until that point. Uh, it was inevitable. Um, I, I, Theo, that, that is the question. I think that's the million dollar legal question. When I say we're now in a post IP world, um, it's great that the Supreme Court of Canada has, has declared users' rights, and I think that will spread, and I think that will spread worldwide. But that's an intellectual property right, um, and <coughs> the, real, <coughs> the real issue of the future, and we're starting to see it, is this... Um, is the issue of privacy and the issue of surveillance. And there's the issue of government surveillance, but there's also the issue of private commercial surveillance. And it really very much is a consumer protection issue. And the sooner we start defining the terms of this um, and, 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 and doing so legally, and it's going to require statutes. It's going to require laws. It's going to require parliamentary action. Um, it doesn't seem to me that there's any other way. Uh, and I am not seeing, um, and, and maybe this is an unfair comment, and, and please, uh, developers among you attack me for this, uh, for being too much of an ivory tower academic, but I am not seeing the video game industry banding together and saying, you know what, we're going to police this. We're going to create a code. We're going to create rules of the road. We're going to create standards of ethical conduct, and we're all going to swear to them and abide by them. And I, what I find disturbing, um, and, and again, maybe I'm being unfair here, but what I really find disturbing is um, how willing um, uh, tech companies have been 
to give away their and phone companies, et cetera, et cetera, have been uh, to give away the privacy and the private users' data of their customers to government. Um, that that's surprising and disappointing. Um, and I think 20 years ago would have been seen as very strange and it's become very normal. Now, uh, because in the stone revelations, you know, companies and tech companies become very embarrassed about it because, you know, and, and, and there are technical consequences. You could make an argument, um, that part of the reason the Xbox One is doing so badly in comparison uh, to the, the Sony PlayStation 4 uh, counterpart is not just because it's 30 to 40 percent less powerful, but because you had a mandatory connect connection and people don't want this sense that, that everything they do um, could somewhere how be available to the outside world. There's no such thing. The one thing we know is there's no such thing as a one-way pipe. If you've got a pipe going out, someone's got a pipe going in if they want it. So uh, I, I, I do wonder if it's, in fact, severely undermined the Xbox One to the point where, I don't know about you guys in New Zealand, but next week in Canada and in North America, you'll be able to buy an Xbox One unbundled without a Kinect, which you know, is not at all what they intended to do because they, they, they said the, the connect was, was integral. So I don't know if that uh, answers your question, but uh, hopefully it was a good start anyways. Yeah, well, it's very speculative. Um, but we're going we're gonna to go on to some other questions now coming in from the Twitch chat from Kinoka. We're going back to mods. Uh, she asks, or he asks, if the author of a mod has their work used by the original creator of the game, what rights can that author assert towards the creator if the creator starts making money out of their mod? I mean, can they, I mean, can are they, they entitled to those profits? profits? I, I, I think that's an awesome question because it illustrates just how complex this is. It comes down to, you first have to make a decision whether the mod maker has some intellectual property rights or not. If they do, then the rights belong to the mod maker, not to the original maker of the game. However, since everybody, every game now comes with end user license agreements and terms of service that define all of this, the issue is actually one of contract, not one of intellectual property law. And that's kind of where we're, we've landed up. So, so, so the answer, the technical answer, the lawyer's answer to the question is, please bring me the end user license agreement and terms of service of the game we're talking about. And then I can tell you what your rights might be, because it's really going to be a contract case, not a copyright case. Brilliant, thanks. Um, now, I'm just checking. Uh, there's a few from the crowd. Um, I think I'll get you to come down and speak into the mic. It might be a bit easier uh, for this setup. Just a moment there, John. Here we are. Uh, oh, hey there. Um, I was just uh, I just wanted to ask you a question. Could you please, if, if at all possible, like, kind of uh, basically outline the kind of definitions of um, racism and sexism that, like, um, that these gaming companies and and, and, and companies like Microsoft use um, uh, when they when they're providing services like Xbox Live in, in order to um, in order to um, in order to um, punish like people who break those laws is yeah sorry sorry I, I know you didn't really, you only really touched on that slightly but um, it was kind of um, yeah, I thought it kind of tied in nicely to what you were talking about earlier about the kind of the lack of standards that um, like lack of universal standards that these companies were um, were agreeing to but yeah. If you just um, um, could outline those definitions, that would be great. Thanks. So um, you've asked the question, you've answered the question, and you've answered it completely correctly. Um, uh, and you've also, uh, you know, contextualized it extremely well. The, 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 the answer from my perspective is we don't really know. 
Um, so it's all it's all contractual, um, uh, and uh, and we don't know what the developers are, where they're drawing the line, except in very specific iterations, very specific examples. So it's sort of like a core, you know, there's general language in the end user license agreement. If anybody ever reads them, and I suggest you just read one so that you get a sense of the breadth of the contractual powers that uh, are being held over you. It becomes very clear, and I don't, I'm not picking on Microsoft or any other company because it's really true of all of them, um, that they can kick you out uh, for any behavior that they don't find appropriate. Um, but as you point out, because there are no codes, because there are no um, specific rules that they set out, and because there's nothing that forces them to, to, to set those out, um, no one really knows. And there's plenty of complaints. You don't have to go far on the forums uh, to find people feeling that they've been unjustly dealt with. Um, and it sort of becomes like, you know, even referees in, in rugby games have a rule book that they're, that they're working off of. Um, we generally don't know the rule book and the industry certainly hasn't got to, gotten together to create a common rule book. So, you know, I, all I've really done is amplified your entirely correct answer to your, to your own question. So, but hopefully it helps a bit. Brilliant. That's good. Um, currently, we've got the required cat pickup for, for questions, just to let you know. Um, we've got one last question that we're going to throw in there from Matsuaka, I believe it is, on the stream. And he asks, how does law in a state work on an international collaboration? Which is, I, I guess, an incredibly complicated matter. Oh, and he what, also what? adds that uh, he's protected in Canada, but the person recording it in Australia, um, can they sell it on TV or be used in advertising elsewhere? Like that, that kind of thing. Um, so... Uh, wonderful question, um, uh, brilliant question, very complex question in some levels, um, very simple in, uh, in other ways. Um, and, you know, here's where there is, uh, I'm going to break I'm going to try and not make this too technical, um, but it does have its complications. I'm going to break this up into three parts. The first question is where can you sue? And there are different legal theories out there that are current and that courts have made decisions on. There are different theories that have been accepted in different places. And sometimes two or three different theories have been accepted in the same place. So where you can sue um, is, is, and the rules around jurisdiction are horrendously complex. Um, and there's no, there's not going to be any clear answer. Uh, that's a pure lawyer's tactical issue. There's going to be lots of choices, um, and, and, uh, there's not much to be done with it. Um, copyright now level two is copyright law and you know where I'm going, but before I get there, I'm going to simply say, one thing that's pretty cool about copyright law is that it's increasingly uniform from an international perspective. The basics of copyright law uh, have been around since the Berne Convention, have been around for uh, not hundreds of years, but, but uh, well over 100 years, um, and are conceived of as international law that is then um, uh, brought into domestic law by each country um, by a vote of its own parliament, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a surprising amount of uniformity around copyright law. I don't want to say copyright law is the same everywhere, and certainly judicial interpretations of copyright law are vastly different, but the basic concepts are the same. But you know where I'm going to go with this because I'm going to say what I've said several times, copyright law is significantly less important than it used to be. 
So where, so where, how does this ultimately resolve? It ultimately resolves by contract. So the answer to your, to your question, sadly, or in this case, fortunately, is what does the contract say? Because the contract, again, contract law, I don't want to say without any shadow of a doubt and in all circumstances, but generally is enforceable everywhere. So, so this problem, which seems um, much too complex uh, and too multidimensional for words, is actually in a good lawyer's hands, not insurmountable at all and will probably be a contract issue and resolved according to contract. The question is, where are you suing? And that, that has not become simpler. That has become more complex in a digital age. So hopefully that, that at least amplifies that one a little bit. John, thank you so much. You've been a great help and a great addition to the knowledge base here at the University of Auckland. And Aspect of Gaming is, is so proud to be able to put this on. Um, yeah, again, thank you so much for joining us, and thanks again to the University of Auckland Video Game Club for helping this come together. It's, it's been an incredible experience. We've got some pizza getting cold outside. We're going to get everyone over there and, uh, and grab in a slice um, and um, a few drinks, thank but thanks again so much. Well, it's been a great privilege. Uh, so much fun uh, for, uh, for a lawyer, uh, for a Canadian lawyer and academic thousands of miles away. It's, uh, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, anytime, uh, I'd be very happy to do it again. Take Hopefully in person one day. Take care. Hey, hopefully hey, in person hopefully one in day person. indeed. And thank you also to the people who have joined us on the stream. I will catch up with you a bit later, John, but I've been Theo from Aspect of Gaming, and this has been a University of Auckland Video Game Club event. Thanks, everyone, for coming. See you, John. Bye-bye.